We'd like to welcome our defending champion, Scotty Scheffler, back to the interview room here at the Players' Championship. Scotty coming off a big win at the uh, Arnold Palmer Invitational presented by MasterCard. Maybe just some opening thoughts on uh, that victory and coming back to uh, the property. Yeah, it was good. Um, good week last week. Um, it's nice to see some uh, see some results of the work that we've been putting in, which was good. Um, it's good to be back here in Florida. I like this golf course. Um, greens are a bit soft right now, but they're also still really fast, which is kind of weird coming from last week where they're really firm and quite fast. Um, but yeah, getting used to a new type of grass, new new bunkers. Um, but yeah, prep work has begun. All right, we'll do questions. Start with Dan. You've been world number one for a while, but it feels like last week was kind of a dominant performance, and the narrative from other guys, Scotty is the guy that we're trying to catch right now. Do you welcome that challenge, and, and how do you kind of deal with those uh, expectations? Um, I don't really think about that kind of stuff. Um, as far as the world rankings go, uh, it's nice to be number one. I'd much rather be number one than number two, but in my day-to-day -day life, it doesn't really affect anything. Um, it's probably a lot harder to stay at number one than it is to get there, and so if it's something that's going to occupy a lot of my thoughts, I don't think that's a very good thing. And so when it comes to tournament weeks, being number one, I don't get don't get any extra strokes. It doesn't do anything for me starting a tournament, um, and so it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. And then obviously the putting stats were so much better last week. Did it feel better? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely hard to argue with the, like a day like Sunday. I think it's nice. Um, you know, I, said, I talked about it a little bit on Sunday, but like it's good to see where I'm at with my process. And like the thing that I appreciated the most was like Thursday, I got off to a really bad start in the greens. I missed a few putts I should have made early in the round. And um, what I was most proud of last week was how I bounced back to things not going how I expected them to. It's not like the whole week I just showed up and I, you know, made every putt. I was I was up a few strokes in putting, but um, I'm most proud of how I stuck to the process and bounced back from those kind of little mistakes. Hi, Scotty. Um, I know you're probably sick of talking about your putter at the minute, um, but why why did you change to a mallet putter? And yeah, I suppose, how did you come to that decision? Um, so I had tried a spider during the playoffs last year. It was a little bit of a different type of spider than the one I used last week. Um, at times last year, I struggled lining the ball up in the middle of the face, so I lined the ball up on the toe sometimes, then I struggled with a tiny bit of a heel strike. And um, that was just, you know, just became kind of my miss. Like if I was fighting a duck hook off the tee, I was fighting a little bit of a heel miss with the putter. And uh, this spider putter is really easy for me to line up. I don't have to use the line on the ball. I line the putter up really well and I line up in the middle of the face and pretty much as simple as that. Um, kind of gives me just a really good visual. Okay, Mark. Hey, Scotty. What is it when you look back, at, whether it's your background or whatever, that allows you to be so unaffected? You know, in obviously you're in a much more prominent role now as number one and whatnot, but you never really seem to waver at all. I don't know if it's your parents, your sisters, whatever. What, what is it that keeps you kind of grounded that way where you don't get too full of it all? Um, well, I, I think that's a nice compliment, so thank you. Um, I try not to get too too into what, you know, we do out here. Um, I think, you know, I attribute it mostly to my faith, but I also have, you know, a great upbringing. I have great parents. You know, I have a great wife. We have great friends at home. And so I'm surrounded by a lot of people that really don't care very much whether or not I won last week. Um, you know, it's great. We're going to celebrate. But at the end of the day, you know, if I shot 75 on Sunday, I think, you know, Monday would have looked pretty similar to how it looked this week, um, you know, besides maybe a few extra text messages in my phone that I received. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, life goes on a lot more than just my golf score. And, um, you know, this is just one little phase of my life, and it just happens to be in front of an audience. But outside of that, you know, home's a lot more important to me than out here. Okay. Good. Uh, Dan in the back. Scotty, for many who uh, will never get to play this course, how would you describe – what it's like to step onto the 7th tee and play such an iconic hole? Oh, on 17? Um, it's pretty wild when you get here in person. Um, sometimes when you're standing there in the practice round, you're like, how could people ever miss this green? And then you get up there and you start standing over your shot, and you're like, man, wait a minute, like the wind's blowing off the right, like it's kind of firm now, and um, it's a lot harder in competition than it is in practice. But it's always really special. You know, you grew up watching this golf tournament, and um, to be here playing is always a special treat. Okay, Gary? Uh, not to put you too much on the spot, family-wise, but did the chocolate cream pie that they made up here hold up to grandma's? 
Uh, yeah, it did. We we uh, we were here for media day on uh, Monday last week, and you know my grandma got to try their version of her chocolate cream pie. She said it was really good. Um, you know, I also thought it was really good. It didn't quite, you know, get to grandma's level, obviously, but um, it was pretty good. You wouldn't say otherwise, even if you believe that, would you? Yes, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> uh, you and Liza, you you won ma- you won a major. You've contended majors, and you won this tournament. Uh, is there anything about this event that's getting closer and closer to a major championship status? Well, I just think that it's special to us as being members of the PGA Tour because it's our tournament. You know, it's our premier event. You know, this is the home of the PGA Tour. And so for us, I think it's a special place to come back year after year and get to play this golf course and, you know, compete with the best players in the world and the best players on our tour. And, um, yeah, it's always a fun week to come here and compete. Gene? I think it's on. Scotty, um, it's been uh, five years since Tiger has played here, and you know, there's no way of knowing whether he will play here again. Um, how much do you would you look forward to the idea of maybe playing with him one more time, or I mean, maybe even multiple times? But it's clear that it's that his career is winding down, and you don't know how many of those opportunities are left. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell you how many of those we had left. But anytime I think you get to play with the, I think. I mean, he's definitely the best player I've ever seen, and I, I think he's the best player we've ever had. And so anytime you can stand up there and, and you know, walk alongside him and, and compete in the same golf tournament as him is really special. And I've had the pleasure of playing with him um, at the Masters a couple years ago. It was the day he made the 10. And um, th- that's the thing is it's all, like, he's just so much different, I think, than the rest of us. Like, he, he's won so many golf tournaments, and, you know, he makes a 10 on number 12 at Augusta, and he birdies five of the last six holes. And it's Sunday. I mean, it's completely meaningless to him at the – like, at that stage in his career, what's what's the point? And for him just to step up there and completely turn it around. And I kid you not, he hit still to this day three of the best iron shots I've ever seen hit um, – coming into those last few holes, and it was just unbelievable to watch. And so any time that we can get him out here competing and playing, I think is really special for all of us. As, as, a, follow, as, a, as a follow-up to that, could you just talk about what it does for you personally when you are in a group with him, knowing that it's a, a, a pressure that's different than anything else you probably experienced on a golf course, how much benefit that is to you moving forward? Well, I just learned a lot by watching him. I mean, the way he competes in this game is is different than a lot of players. I mean, he puts everything he has into every shot that he hits on the golf course, which I think is a really underrated skill out here. Like, when he steps over a ball at any moment in the golf tournament, whether it's his first shot on Thursday or the last shot on Sunday, I feel like he is as into it as he could possibly be. And I just learned that by watching him, the way he read greens, the way he approached pitch shots and iron shots and tee shots. There was never a moment in that round where he wasn't going at it up, you know, a thousand percent, um, which is a lot easier, I think, said than done. Hey, Scotty, um, you told a story a while back that when you were about like six or seven at Royal Oaks in Dallas, someone on the driving range um, challenged you to hit a pole that was about a hundred yards out. And if you did that, he'd buy you a car when you were 17. Now your dad said that you hit it twice do you remember that? Uh, any update on the car? Is you still waiting on that? <laughs> um, I'm still waiting on the car. Um, you know, um, no, as far as the story goes, Randy's here this week. So if you see Randy, you can ask him a story. But it's something along the lines of, you'll give me five shots to hit the pole, and I'll get a car when I turn 16. Just set it in jest. And um, I think I hit it maybe on the third try. And then, um, you know, I was like eight years old at the time. So it was more of a joke than anything. So, yeah, still waiting on the car. But, um, yeah, ask Randy. I, I, I think it's true, but we'll see. Yeah, Ryan. Scotty, speaking of Randy, I think it's the first time in a while that he's been out here. Um, while some players have their swing coaches out here on tour every single week, uh, how has that process gone for you, not having like a second set of eyes immediately after a round while still maintaining this level of ball striking that you have for the past two years? Well, believe it or not, Randy's pretty tech savvy. He's got this iPad where he can watch shots and stuff. Um, so he's he's actually, he, he gets a lot of info. You know, Blake got him set up with his iPad and he can watch, you know, live coverage and all that stuff. And um, I think that's that's the most valuable. And if he can have anything to say, he can usually communicate it either directly to me or through Ted when we're on the range. You know, I can FaceTime him, um, you know, I just don't 
I don't really think it's that complicated. I think that um, a lot of the stuff he can see on TV and I can tell him what I'm feeling. And I, I mean, he's basically taught me everything I know about the game of golf. And so um, I don't think it's really hard for him to, to watch and just see what I look like out there and kind of know if there's an issue and if there's not an issue. Okay. Alex? Oh, Scotty. Over the last year, how many uh, different putters do you think you've tested? And why do you think the new one has proved most successful? What's different about it? Um, well, I, I, first of all, I don't know. Um, second of all, the uh, like I said earlier, um, it makes it easier for me to line it up in the center of the face. It's good for me visually, and I like the way kind of the ball comes off the face. And so um, it's, it's helping me just be more kind of outward with my putting than focusing on what's going on right here, just focusing on the picture of the putt. Okay, we'll go to Doug. Scotty, if you if you throw Tiger, I'm sorry, way back here, um, throw Tiger out for a minute in in your time on on paying attention to golf. Who's been the last dominant figure? Do you think on the PGA Tour? Well, Doug, you kind of put me in a little corner here by taking Tiger away. Um, I mean, to be completely honest, I think as far as I'm concerned, in, in my lifetime, Tiger's really been the guy that's dominated basically for the last, since, you know, 1997, up until about 2020, whenever he really got hurt. Um, I don't know if we'll ever see anything like that again in the game of golf. Um, as far as who else has been dominant, I think you've had a lot of guys that go through stretches where they are. Um, you know, you had Jordan go through his stretch. He had a year where JT won five times. You know, had those years where Rory was winning majors by a bunch of shots. And um, nobody's really been able to have the longevity that, that Tiger had. Um, but, yeah, there's always certain guys that kind of pop up on the radar and win a bunch of tournaments at once, like Jason Day is another guy who did it. Um, I mean, I'm sure if you give me a few more minutes, I can think of some more, but nobody really had that kind of sustained. I mean, trying to bring baby out of the corner here, but, but you could probably <laughs> throw yourself of late. DJ, maybe a couple years yeah, ago. Yeah, DJ as well, yeah. John during his stretch. And I guess my question is, if how hard would it be to do now and how much would it either help or hurt golf if it ever happened? Not to Tiger's level, but to a kind of a sustained maybe two to three to four years level. I, I think it'd be good for the game. I think any time you have those, a figure that kind of dominates, um, like I think of like the NBA, you look at Steph Curry for those years where the Warriors were winning a bunch. I mean, people would say they got tired of it, but at the end of the day, people were still you know showing up and watching because he was incredible to watch and you want to watch you know, greatness when you're out there. And so I don't, uh, I think it'd be good for the game of golf. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens with the, in the sport in the next few years. It's a, it's a pretty challenging game and we got a lot of talent out here. So, you know, being that dominant figure, I think is a, is a very tall task to ask of anybody. But, you know, we got some guys out here that, that I think can definitely pull it off. Alex. Yeah, Scotty, it, it, a lot of people are talking about the world rankings and if they're accurate, not accurate, so forth and so on. During your, tenure of being world number one did you feel always that you were playing or you were world number one did I feel like that uh I wouldn't say so I mean I, I never really thought of myself as world number one so I wouldn't really want to compare myself too much to other people um as far as the accuracy of the world rankings go at the top I think they're fairly accurate um and then when you get more into you know, the lower ranks, it becomes pretty skewed, obviously, because there's certain groups of guys that aren't getting any ranking points. And it was kind of a thing that you saw when guys went to live, you know, their their golf games took a little bit of a hit, um, just basically from a strokes gain perspective. And, you know, you have another ranking system you can look at for the strokes gained. Um, and I would say, arguably, that would be a more accurate ranking system now. Um, the world rankings, I th still think, is a, is a good ranking system, but it's it's missing a few players for sure. Do you think also, uh, just to go about something else, do you think also these fields now with those guys that playing on other tours, do you think these fields lack to some extent because they're not here? Um, I don't really spend much time in my day thinking about them. Um, you know, it's kind of one of the out of sight, out of mind things, and the people that want to be on this tour are still here, and the guys that want to compete out here are still here. And so um, we got a lot of great competition. I'm excited with the new tournament schedule, getting the, the best players on our tour all together as much as we can, and, um, you know, I think we're in a great spot. Okay, Alan. Hey, Scotty. Uh, Jay earlier was talking a little bit about maybe fans feeling like they haven't 
had their voice felt over the last couple of years. I'm wondering, among the players, how, how much of a concern is it that fans are maybe feeling a little disillusioned or disenchanted by, you know, the developments over the last couple of years, the splintering of the stars across two tours, all the talk about money? How much, among the players, how much of a concern is that? Um, well, I, I guess it's, it's a pretty broad question. And when you're talking about a fan perspective, you're talking about millions of people. And so there's always a lot of perspectives in that group. It just depends on who has the loudest voice. And... I mean, at the end of the day, I think we're trying to do our best to create the best product for the fans, but we can't control whether or not guys want to leave. If guys want to go take the money and leave, then that's their decision. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell guys not to take hundreds of millions of dollars. If that's what they think is best for their life, then go do it. Um, I'm not going to sit here and force guys to stay on our tour. Um, but at the end of the day, this is where I want to be, and – you know, we're continuing to grow what we're doing and what they're doing is not really a concern to me. And if they want, if the fans are upset, then look at the guys that left. You know, we had a tour, we were all together and the people that left are no longer here. And at the end of the day, that's where the splintering comes from. And as far as our tour goes, like I said, we're doing our best to create the best product for the fans. And that's really where we're at. Hey, Scotty, uh, you've maintained a pretty historic ball striking, at least by strokes gained, uh, through to this season. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, are you tweaking things constantly with your swing? Because when we see you, it just seems like it's been automatic for the last year. But are you constantly still making tweaks to what the swing looks like? Yeah, uh, for sure. I think golf's a pretty challenging game. Um, and so I'm constantly putting in the work to maintain where I'm at. You know, always working on my grip, always working on the fundamentals. Um, usually when my swing gets out of whack, it's usually something fundamental that's going wrong. And, you know, it's going to cause some sort of, you know, thing to happen in my swing. And it usually always comes down to the fundamentals of setup and whatnot. And it's been pretty sustainable. And then on terms of the putting, is that something so fickle that you never feel like that could be sustained for long stretches? Or do you feel like that's achievable? Do I feel like what's achievable? Like sustained uh, like success with the putting based on how fickle it is, misses, you know? I mean, yeah, I think in certain ranges you see guys that are really good putters. Like if you were to look at the data of, let's say, like a Denny McCarthy, I'm sure statistically inside of 20 feet he's always one of the best. Um, but once you get outside of that range, you know, Every, it really becomes a little bit more of, of luck involved. Like the guy you see leading from 40 feet every year is not the same, but the guys you see leading from, you know, five to 15 feet are probably pretty similar each year. Okay. We're going to go Luke and then in the back and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, last potting question, I promise. Um, well, from, from you. Yeah. From me, yeah. <laughs> I think generally. But anyway, um, you went from using the line on the ball to not using the line and switching potter because that helps you line up. I'm just wondering what are the pros and cons in your mind of each like what did each method help you do better than others yeah that's a good question so um i guess i'll start here like when you're not performing as well as you should at something what is the solution always it's typically just to try harder at that thing well if you're missing your jump shot well you need to practice your jump shots more and if i'm missing putts well then i need to practice my putting more but I think it goes a little bit more in depth with, than that. You know, at times last year, I think I definitely tried too hard on my putting. And the idea of not going to the line is to become more free over the ball. And I found a putter now where when I, or I found a putter now that I line up very well and the line on the ball I was using to help myself line up. You know, I wasn't using it as trying to hit it perfect each time or using it in anything else other than to try and help myself line up. And at times, I think it got to the point where a ball would go in, but if that ball didn't roll end over end at the back of your head, you're like, wait, did I hit that putt really good? Or, you know, I think sometimes I expected perfection out of myself. And I'm like that in a lot of different things. And so when it comes to the putting, now not using the line just to be more free, to not try as hard, which is a heck of a lot easier said than done because, you know, worked my entire life to get here to the PGA Tour and to have chances to win majors, have chances to win tournaments out here. And it's a lot easier to say, hey, it doesn't really matter if you miss or make it. But at the end of the day, it, it matters a heck of a lot to me whether or not that putt goes in or not. But it's about sticking to my process and can controlling what I can control. And that's having a good attitude and hitting a good putt and not using the line, I think has helped a good amount in that. Okay, last question. Scotty, no one's defended a title here so far ever. What do you think makes it so tough? Also, what do you think it's, you're gonna have to do to hopefully be the first one to get that done? 
I just think it's a golf course where you don't see a lot of repeat winners in general. You know, there's not a guy that you've seen win on this golf course a bunch. And I think it's just the nature of the course. It doesn't really suit one type of player. You know, it really is, you know, Pete Dye, just kind of genius design where you have to hit all different kinds of shots and it tests you in a lot of different ways. And, I mean, I, that's why I think it's one of the best places we play on tour just because it really doesn't suit one type of player. And um, bomb and gouge doesn't really work out here. You kind of got to plot your way around. But then you even have the, the shorter hitters that plot it around that can struggle here because you got to hit it exactly where you're looking or you're going to be punished pretty severely out here. Scotty, thanks so much for the time. Best of luck this week. Thanks, y'all.